Lloyd. Hello. Welcome to Modo. Welcome to the podcast. It's very good to have you on. And thanks for coming all the way down to Birmingham from somewhere up north, I think. Yes, yeah, great to be here. Great yeah. to be here. Yeah, I've come down from Yorkshire today. Very nice. Yeah. Um, I guess so. Um, we're absolutely delighted to have Lloyd on to talk about um, investing, so um, venture investing in this space, um, what's happening in clean tech, what's happening in energy, um, and also some bigger picture stuff around wind and, and some other things. And Lloyd, we already know each other pretty well, so the disclosure here is Lloyd is on the Modo board. So Lloyd works for Fred Olson, we can talk about that in a second, um, who invested in Modo early this year. So uh, we already know each other pretty well, um, but now I get to ask you all the difficult questions. Mm. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming on. And um, do you want to maybe give a bit about your background, um, what you did until here, that kind of thing? Sure. Yeah, so um, my background is that I started out at Deloitte. Uh, I was there for several years, uh, chartered as an accountant, um, did a fairly classic route on a grad scheme. Uh, I then went into corporate finance, um, and I worked in unloved company divestitures, which is, you know, FTSE 100 businesses selling divisions. Um, either to trade is that or real, financial is that how they describe it, unloved? Or that, I, that's how that I would describe time? it. That was okay. how I would describe that's it. That's not yeah. technical I, I, don't, I don't think that's, uh, I think, I think the, the industry would describe it that way. Okay, but, cool. uh, generally, generally that, was, that was what it was. And, mm -hmm. then, um, and then thereafter, you know, my, my true passion was to get involved in clean tech and renewable energy. So uh, I joined a fund in Switzerland um, and we did um, lots of different things from anaerobic digestion to on onshore wind, a bit of residential solar and also fiber broadband as well. Okay. And now, um, since so you joined Fred Olson a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, 2020. And what, um, what, what does Fred Olson do? Okay, so... And what do you do there? Yeah, so, sure. So, um, Fred Olson, Bonner, uh, there's two names there. Um, I can explain a bit about that. But um, it's really a conglomerate. I mean, there's lots of different business divisions, um, and they are doing different things. Um, however, most of the business is aligned in some way to the wind industry. Um, so Bonaire is the listed vehicle, which is listed on the Oslo Stock Exchange. It's been listed for uh, a very long time, since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and it's part owned in uh, free flow and part owned by the Olsen family, which is where the Fred Olsen name comes from. And so anybody can go and buy shares in Bonaire. Correct. But there's also um, a chunk of shares that are exclusively for the, uh, the Fred Olsen family. Correct. Okay. That's right. And within the business, there's some broad divisions, but uh, I mean... In, in sort of simplest terms, one of them is the generating business, the renewable mm -hmm. energy business. Um, that's mostly onshore wind, uh, but there's a significant pipeline of offshore wind as well. Uh, so there's nearly a gigawatt of uh, onshore and then several gigawatts of offshore and onshore wind in the pipeline. Um, and that is spread between Scotland, Norway, Sweden, and then the North Sea, the Irish Sea, etc. Okay. And Global Wind Service, uh, which is an installation technician's business in, uh, in and around Scandinavia. Um, and then the other business which is worth mentioning is uh, wind carry, which is jack-up vessels. So these are the vessels which install offshore wind turbines. Um, so this is, uh, this is ships on legs, right? Correct. Ships yeah. on legs. That's exactly it. So they, you know, they, they sail along, they put four legs down, they bring themselves out of the water. That gives the boat the stability to then do these precise movements, crane-based movements, to actually install the pile and then the, you know, the sail and the blades on, on top. Um, so it's an you know, amazing, amazing thing. And that business has actually installed 20% of all of the wind turbines outside China um, to date. Wow. Yeah. And so how many, how many um, vessels, boats do they... I know boats are on what? Ships, vessels, whatever. How many, how vessels many, is fine, yeah. Vessels is fine. <laughs> how, how many do they have? So they've got three vessels. Um, and the, they've been through an upgrade program. So they are now upgraded with the, the largest cranes um, such that they are able to deliver the, the biggest turbines out there. Uh, so 10 assuring. megawatt plus? Well, 10 megawatt was the biggest turbine, but now uh, both GE and Siemens are producing turbines at 15 megawatt, and they're looking for bigger turbines. So you know, they're aiming to get to even bigger than that by the end of this decade. Okay, mm. cool. I guess we're talking about jack-up vessels now, but they're pretty, pretty crazy. So mm. um, the, you can only do jack-up vessel stuff in fairly shallow seas, right? Um, yep. So you're looking at sort of continental shelf style installations. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so th there is that, and we also have a, an innovations business as well, which is Fred Olsen 1848, and they are uh, developing uh, floating wind technology as well, so we're addressing that part of the, right, okay. the market. But certainly for the jack-up vessels and the, the, uh, the offshore wind market as it is now, um, you are looking at shallower waters, so, you know, sub-50 sub meters, something but like that. But there's plenty of it around. Yeah. And so um, and what about, um, so what's the, what, what's, the, what's the history of Fred Olsen? 
um, who is, was Fred, Fred Olson and um, what does that mean for the company and also for the push for renewables? Sure. So uh, the business has been around since 1848. Um, it was set up uh, by the Olsen brothers um, in, in Norway. Um, it's now in, I think, the sixth generation. Um, and um, the business has been through lots of different life cycles. So initially it was uh, sailboats moving ice to the UK. Um, and, you know, that's transitioned through uh, shipping, uh, through bulk and um, various other products, fruit, um, airlines, offshore drilling. So one of the first businesses to drill offshore um, off the Norwegian shelf. Um, and thereafter, pivoted into renewable energy. So, I mean, the, the, the business was uh, the, the first consented or consented the first wind farm in the UK uh, back in the 90s. Wow. Um, and then has continued that transition to, to the point where we've divested everything that was associated with drilling, exploration, oil and gas um, earlier in the 2010 decade. So um, it's that, that transition is now complete. And as I said, those, those business verticals that you see now are pointing fully towards the energy transition. And so what do you do at the company? So um, amongst my team, you know, I'm, I'm here in the UK, the rest of the team is, is over in Norway. We are um, fulfilling a corporate venture capital and also a, a corporate development role. Um, most of the things that we look at are fitting in with the energy transition. So um, we're looking for um, the gaps that are left by being a pure play uh, renewables generator on the renewables side um, and also a consultant aligned to the industry. So, you know, one of the things that we spend most of our time talking about, of course, is storage, uh, but also when we think about the industry itself, the supply chain of that, now that might not be just the manufacturer of particular components, but when I talk about supply chain, I mean things like consulting services, data, software, et cetera, all these things that need to come together and, and mesh to make it work. That's, that's what we're looking at. Um, the corporate development side of things is, is more supporting the other business verticals. So that might be helping them with capital projects. Um, it might be helping them with business cases, um, you know, whether it be um, adding two forms of generation together, adding storage to an existing site and things like that. And you guys have had some pretty big success in, in wind recently. Do you want yeah. to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I think that the, the biggest project that we have at the moment uh, standalone is the Codling Bank project in, um, in the Irish Sea. Um, that's a one and a half gigawatt project, which is in a joint venture. Um, and that at the moment- Who's the other party? Um, it is EDF. Okay. Um, and that project is, is relatively progressed. Um, there is the, the, um, the Irish RS bidding um, going on at the moment, I think this year. Um, but that, that's, you know, that's gonna be huge um, if, that, if that goes ahead, which we hope it will. The other one, which was uh, in the headlines earlier this year was uh, the Scotwind uh, leasing round, which um, we entered into a JV with Vattenfall. Um, and uh, that's an 800 megawatt floating wind project. So, um, you know, we've touched on floating wind. Yep. There's a lot that needs to happen um, to get a floating wind project up, running, connected, and operational um, by the end of the decade. But, you know, we're, we're confident that that's going to happen. And, and certainly, you know, these areas of high wind resource are not conducive to piling the seabed. So this technology solution, which is now being brought online, um, you know, we are very confident and also, you know, bullish that that, that is going to be realized. So um, all systems go to build 800 megawatts of offshore, floating offshore wind. And I think we had Kerry came on recently to talk about floating wind. But mm. I think the biggest we've got in the UK is less than 100 megawatts at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of work to do yes, there. Yeah. How far offshore is it? It's a, long way, spot, yeah, it's, it's yeah. a long way off Aberdeen. It's a long way off Aberdeen, sure. I yeah. mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a long way, but uh, I, think, I think probably about 100 miles offshore. Yeah. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to talk a little bit, so we talked a little bit about um, corporate development. So mm. I guess that's you and your team supporting the rest of the Fred Olsen business mm. to identify opportunities. Mm -hmm. Today, we're gonna, I want to pick your brains on the venture world. Yeah. You, you, you and your team make venture investments, right? Which is mm -hmm. investing in startups like Modo, but also in other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so what are you, let's start with what you're looking for. Mm. So we, uh, when, when we think about different cases, we're looking for a, an identifiable niche. Um, and that's a, a fairly common requirement, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, 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 it's looking for something, a technology or a business which properly addresses the problem. There's plenty of businesses that create a straw man problem and then their technology miraculously addresses that, but you know, real problems that people are faced with, whether that's you know, overcoming a, a technological hurdle, whether it's making an efficiency gain, whether it's decarbonizing or electrifying something. So that, that's one part of it. 
Um, the other thing we're looking for is some demonstration of, of commercial success. Um, I think that that's because you know we're not trying to finance R and D, um, so we kind of we, we would we would hope that it's through an R and D cycle and has managed to demonstrate some degree of commercial success in the market. Um, and then the other thing is is really that meaningful impact. So does it does it fit with the the business's ethics as a whole? Does it yep. fit with the energy transition? Does it make a meaningful impact? You know, is it something that we can be proud to stand up and say, you know, this is making a difference? Okay. And what about, um, so you guys made quite a few investments. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk through some of the companies? I know you're on a few boards. Mm -hmm. um, what, 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 what do those companies do? What's the opportunity and why, why did Fred Olsen invest? Sure. So um, one of the ones we invested in last year based in um, Winnersh, which is near Reading, is Tapio. Um, Tapio is a zero emissions boiler, so that's what they've created. Um, and so, do they, do they call it Z Z ZEB or ZEB? Or the the ZEB. Yeah. ZEB, ZEB yeah. That's, that's the acronym, yeah. yeah. If I said the ZEB. No, um, I've, seen, yeah. I've seen the ZEB <laughs> around places. I've seen the ZEB, Lloyd. Yeah. Um, okay, so they've got a zero emissions boiler. Yes. And um, how big is the company and what's the opportunity? So the company, um, they are mid-30s people mm -hmm. now uh, from, from, from memory. And, and their, their opportunity is, is massive. Um, that is decarbonizing heat. So heat is a huge issue um, in the UK. We heat most of our homes with gas. And that's actually the same in, in Western Europe, not in Northern Europe, our Norwegian uh, neighbors, Swedish, Finnish neighbors, they found the heat pump, they backed it and they've got it in all the homes. Uh, but for some reason, uh, the uptake of heat pumps in the rest of Western Europe hasn't been great. Do they think it's bonkers? Do, they, are they, do, you, do, you, try, do you have to explain, I, do you have to explain like, okay, we've got this business because in the UK we burn gas for heat yeah. and they say, what? <laughs> you guys they, still do that? There, there is there is an education piece. You know, when when, when I first presented renewable heat as a as a com, as a sort of a an idea, um, it was there was a bit of you know this flabbergasted reaction. Why is this an issue? One of the one of the consumer concerns in the UK about heat pumps is they don't work in cold temperatures. But none of these people have obviously spent a January in Norway because you know if you're heating your house in January in Norway with a heat pump. You can do it in the UK. Um, yeah. but frankly, there's there's no no issues there. So is it mostly heat pump in Norway? We're yes, yes, that's yeah. right. Mo so they've got they've got the highest uptake in Europe. We have the lowest uptake here. So um, you know that, and that's that's for lots of different reasons. Um, I would say one of them is a scrambled subsidy regimen. The other one is customer inertia and and sort of it's not it's not a dynamic industry, the heat industry. So you know people people only think about this when they have an issue or they need to make a change. But what Tepio is doing, which is, is really interesting, is firstly, they're electrifying heat, so, so is a heat pump. But what a heat pump doesn't do in our, in our housing stock, which is very leaky, leaks a lot of heat and hasn't been properly insulated, is it, it turns heat into a flexible load. And that's the, that's the interesting bit, because with a heat pump, you can retrofit a heat pump to most properties, but at great cost, and it will be running all the time in the yeah, winter yeah. months because of the, the building fabric. And what Tepio is doing is saying, here's th uh, 40 kilowatt hours of thermal storage, in a thermal core within your house, and you can charge it when you like, and you can discharge it through the day so that you get a whole day's worth of heat. You know, um, like in the old the, storage heater model, winter. right? Sorry? A bit like old storage heaters. Correct, um, but just way better insulated, much higher thermal capacity, and with all the smart technology to make use of your agile tariffs so that you're charging optimum times and discharging uh, when it's expensive. And that's really the crux of this, is it's, it's turning that asset into a flexible load, you know, rather than saying, electrify everything, but everyone's using heat at the same time because people use yes. heat at the same time because they're cold at the same time. And so um, uh, let's talk about each company in detail because mm. you and I have never really done this, so this is, this is great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Tepio, what does it cost to, 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 to get one of these boilers? It's, it's for domestic, right? Or is it also- It's for domestic, domestic. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that boiler will, will, is, is effectively sized for the median house, okay. right? So it's not gonna do the mansion. Um, and similarly, in a flat, it might be a bit too big, um, yeah. but it's, it's for the median house, so it's a mass market product. Um, and cost-wise, um, I mean, it's, it's somewhere in the region of six and a half to seven thousand pounds. Okay, so not far off a normal, uh, say a normal boiler, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, a so it's, Worcester it's a, boiler. It, or correct, so it's a bit more than, than, a, than a gas boiler, it's less than a, a, a retrofitted heat pump for, for, okay. for sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I just had a heat pump fitted, I got the subsidy, but mine still cost 13 grand you know, in a, in, a, in a terrace house. So that gives you an idea of, of, the, of the sort of the scale After of the market. After the subsidy? Well, well, the, well, well I, was, I was in the, the renewable heat incentive subsidy, which, which is a seven year payback yeah. over, over the sort of the life of the running of the thing. So I will get most of that back, but having, having the money up front to be able to do that is what put 
huge amount of people yeah. off heat pumps because it is a significant capital investment. So this sits somewhere in between. By the way, is that index linked? That yes, it, it is. is. Yeah. Yes, it is. And there's a reason why that's now been shut down. So that's been replaced by something called the boiler upgrade scheme, which is a 5,000 upfront capital subsidy. But even still, you know, if you're still yeah. got to find another seven or eight grand, it's a lot of money, especially when the reason you're going to change is part of because you're getting hammered with energy bills. And we've got the whole cost of living crisis. So Correct. So someone finding a 10 grand down the back Correct. of the sofa is fairly Correct. unlikely. All right. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's Tepia. Are they, that's so they just mainly UK based? I guess the market's big enough in the UK. The market is is plenty big enough here. I mean, yeah. they, 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 are, they will be addressing uh, Europe as well. Uh, but at the moment, it's, it's about really demonstrating the scale in the UK and they've got ma they're manufacturing the device um, in one ash triangle um, oh, wow. and they'll be um, the, you know they're, they're going going through a growth phase at the moment there's a lot of really good businesses in Winash there Winash are keeps, yeah Winash keeps on coming up exactly yeah, yeah. I mean it's not you, you can't just think of the office and Ricky Gervais no there. <laughs> there, there is it's, it's moved on a lot since the early 2000s yeah. um, what about the other ones so we've done Tepio um, yeah. what, 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 which other companies are you involved with? So we invest in Measurable Energy last year, which is a smart measurable plug. Measurable Energy. Yeah, Measurable yeah. Energy. So measurable.energy is uh, a URL, and they, they are a smart plug socket um, and a, a, a software platform that sits behind that. Um, imagine a, a plug socket as it is, but behind like it, these, just, like just there, yeah, here, one of those. Yeah. But behind it, there's a PCB. And that is measuring power. It's also doing machine learning, and it's also doing control of the socket. So when you plug that lamp in, the socket's able to know from the power signal of that lamp that it is a lamp, and therefore it's a discretionary device, a discretionary load, and it can be turned off. So if you walk out of here at night and you don't turn it off, the socket will know that the office is finished and turn it off. Because there's, there's no um, power converter to like you have on a laptop or something like that, or a TV. Correct. It's not a DC. It's not a digital system. It's just a exactly. Bolt. It's all yeah, exactly. It's all it's all analog. So you know, so so most of the things that we plug in sockets aren't smart. Yeah. So there are some smart devices out there, but they're also dumb if you don't connect them to the to the system when you yeah. bought them right so um so this is this is taking the human out of it and that's the first thing the other thing is they have a light on the front which indicates different metrics it can indicate the, carb the carbon intensity of the grid at the time so you can then discretionary you can make a discretionary decision about when to take power oh if so if i'm about to plug in my phone to charge it i look at the front plate of yep. the, and it says on a red i assume or, red yeah it goes red and I go, uh, that's not very good for the environment. It's pretty coldy, way. pretty it's gassy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, and cool. then, exactly. And then you can do it later. Or, or you can actually have the app do that for you. So you can leave it plugged in and then it take, it charges or puts the power in when it's best to do so. Mm -hmm. But it also can do that for price. So if you're thinking about a time view tariff, it's going green and red throughout the day because you can actually see, oh, it's cheap now, it's expensive. So I am or I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave my... 2000 watt vacuum clean until 10 <laughs> yeah, o'clock tonight yeah. annoy the neighbors but save some money right so <laughs> that type of thing and it's and it's and it's uh, envisaged it, it is a b2b product so it's for commercial buildings more than it is for domestic properties i've used it in my own house and i've used it um, as an extension leaf for my laptop i can see how much power i've used um in relation to my work so i can you know make a tax deduction off that if i if i liked um which is a nice little use case in itself but it's really for commercial offices and what they can get is about 20%, 15 to 20% um, overall power reduction for the building, which is incredibly That's meaningful. Cool. That's yeah. very cool. Um, I am surprised how slow smart plugs have taken. Smart plugs, I'm talking about, I know we're talking about sockets here, but mm. smart plugs and stuff like that has, has been to, to really grab a hold. And I can't work out what it is because I don't think it's cost. Mm. I don't think it's technology. Mm. What is it? Uh, because high, we had Hive, and yeah. we had you know we had the Amazon stuff and the Google. This hasn't really happened. Yeah. I've got all of my. Like, I'm, I'm kind of into home automation, as a, uh, a lot of weird guys like me are, are into it, um, and I really really like it. But I just can't believe how it just hasn't taken taken off. I think you know I th I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Ten years ago, we were talking about Industry 4.0. We were talking about Internet of Things taking over the world. It it was yeah. going to be the future. It hasn't really got there. I think that the, the reasons are there's a few. Like one is concerns over cybersecurity, which is always the big one. Um, you know, the, the way that Measurable have made a difference is that each of their sockets is air gapped from the system. So you can't get into one and then shut everything down. You yeah. can only get into one if you, if you really manage to break in over Wi Fi. Um, I think the other thing is that the benefits, you know, 
a lot of the benefits of these things are gimmicky or tangential, <laughs> right? I mean, I love how, the gimmicky ones. Well, this is it. But you New know, Year's Eve at midnight when all your lights go crazy. Which that's what I live for. Well, I, and, and that's <laughs> fine. Obviously, I'm told, what I mean was, there's no way I was at home. I was at a, I was, I was at a rave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it was just you on your just own, me yeah. when Jules yeah, Holland in the I living guess. room. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, that, so that's part of it is the tangential benefits, right? And we we were waiting for something which has got a meaningful benefit changing a plug socket is not an everyday decision. It's not something we think about. <laughs> it's just there and it <laughs> yeah. works when it works, it yeah. doesn't work when it doesn't. Yeah. So you have to have something meaningful. You have to say, can I really save carbon? And are the energy savings big enough? And are the cost savings big enough to justify me getting a screwdriver out, risking electro electrocuting myself and changing the, changing the socket or putting electricity? Yeah, how do you in? make it sexy? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I guess the carbon thing is sexy to, I would think carbon's cool reducing carbon but maybe most people don't care yeah and the other thing is so like sockets it really matters what they look like yes i guess for b2b it's not so bad but mm. for, a for, for consumers mm. like if it doesn't look nice you're not going to put it in your house yeah well they look better than that one i'll say that <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. It's, it, and that was it. You it wasn't, it wasn't your me. decision. It wasn't your decision. But they have a strip light, and then yeah, the yeah. light sort of ca the, it casts down on the socket. So it's it's like the whole thing's illuminated, but it really isn't. Very nice. And that and that reduces the um, the standby wattage, of course, right? Because you can't have a you can't have a, a smart socket in there that's actually a vampire device. Burning. Yeah, yeah. You know, even because that's what it was there to do in the first place to save the power. So um, that's, that company's called Measurable Energy or Measurable Dot Energy. Yeah. And how, what, what kind of size company is that? Um, so they are um, about 15 people. Um, okay. They are in Reading as well. So they're in the, the oh, M4 yeah. corridor. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and they're, they're, they've got about, you know, well, they've got a big basket now of commercial customers. Uh, they've got channel partners um, who, who, are, who are then distributing the devices onto their tenants in buildings, so real estate companies. Um, do you have to pay a subscription? Yes, you yeah, you the, do. So the there's cloud costs and all of that. The control yeah, must, exactly. then there's an overhead to that, right? Exactly. So the, 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 there's the capital cost of the device, um, which is which is not not big. Um, it's it's cheap for a smart socket, and then there's an ongoing subscription. Of, it's a, it's a fairly nominal sum, um, and and that's all priced around you know being less than the the cost savings from the device itself, yeah, right? Of course. Sense. So um, so the idea is that you know the the, the big benefit is the cost saving chunk of that goes to subscription and then everyone shares in the the impact of the device being installed i can't believe how long we've just spent talking about plug sockets i, I agree absolutely i think this it. every day but <laughs> you know um what about the other yeah. guys so you, we've done measurable energy tepio um what are the investments has fred Olson made that are uh, sure. interesting or that you're on the board of uh, so um, on the board of we we uh, we set up a logistics business as well, which um, is is fairly fledgling out of Felix though, um, doing green logistics so um, to to help with scope for emissions, um, but that's fairly early stages. Um, and then um, on the so my colleagues have, have invested in a business called New Power Partners, which is a offshore wind consultancy um, out of Denmark. Um, we also invested in a battery technology company in Norway called Sonata, um, which is uh, silicone anode coating. Uh, it's always a, a mouthful, but it's uh, it's to increase the energy density of a lithium-ion battery. Um, so other uh, cell, so other cell, yeah. correct? Yeah. So um, so that's another one that we're in as well. Sonata, spelt C E N A T E. Not S, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, so all over the place. And mm. so what about um, what are the trends in? So a lot, a lot of what you do is venture capitalist stuff. So what's the what are the key trends in venture capital? What mm. for the companies and startups in the energy space need to consider? What what's happening out there at the moment? I guess the first thing to talk about is um, there's a bit of a bloodbath in America, right? In valuations, mm. um, in in the stock market in general, but also in in particularly later stage startups. So startups that have been around for a long time that are raising shed loads of cash mm. are finding it more difficult. Less so for earlier stage. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely spot on. Um, 20 cool. I'll ask another question. <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I was just answering my own questions here. <laughs> yeah. So 2020 and 2021 were really defined as being this, this uh, very hot market. Um, lots of heady valuations. Um, and a lot of it was uh, in the US. I mean, Europe wasn't entirely insulated, but generally was from a lot of the evaluation excesses. Um, and there were there were some some mantras which were going around. Um, you know, you heard a lot. It was this kind of market share at all costs, growth at all costs. You know, that was the most important thing. If you can beat the competition, you can monopolize the market. 
and then you can get your free cash flow, right? Um, but actually, that's a really expensive way to do it, and it sometimes ignores some key business fundamentals, which you know are never going away. There, there is always going to be the need to to eventually get to profitability to self sustaining, and you can only do so many fundraising rounds. And so, you know, the one that's been in the news recently is Klarna. Um, so Klarna raised a huge amount of money. Uh, it's Klarna, now take, the sort of buy, um, buy now pay later. buy a t-shirt now pay for in three months time. Correct. Whatever it works. Yeah. So they so they they fundraised and then they've just done another uh, in twenty twenty I think or twenty twenty one they've just done another fundraise eighty percent eighty seven percent down on the previous fundraise valuation right so a huge haircut and then. There's there's lots of there's lots of this in the public markets as well. You know everything from Lemonade, the insurance business, to Lyft, the ride sharing, um, Energy Vault, um, Nikola, the vehicle yeah. company. They've seen massive adjustments in valuation, and you know a lot of this comes back to um, people actually really scrutinise those business models and looking for that you know that sustain, self sustaining future. So where we sit as a European focused investor is that you know we're, we're quite happy that Europe is, is is generally insulated from a lot of this. What do you mean by insulated? As in we didn't have the froth. We didn't have in the same as kind much. of way. Yeah, as it's in America. There, there, there were SPACs and there were fundraisers, but SPAC not being a, a a special purpose acquisition company. So this is where you've got a uh, another company that's already listed on the spot stock market, and you do a reverse merger. So you put the the new company into that. And it takes over it, you know, like the praying mantis. It sort of like consumes this it. This is nuts, right? So just like a bit of an explain. Uh, this is how I understand it. So you could have like a hundred-year-old, like um, you know, father and son business that in America that got on the stock market in like 1950 or whatever, mm. and then they make widgets and they've been doing that forever. But they kind of, that business has kind of gone down the pan. And then someone else comes in and goes, right, I'm going to buy that because you've already passed all the tests to get on the stock market. Get rid of the widget business, and now I've got an empty shell. And I'm going to go and acquire, I don't know, a, a, a startup that isn't make, yet making revenue. Correct. And then I d I've got them onto the stock market without having to go through all the rigmarole of, 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 of all, all of the legal and all of the stuff you have to do to get the stock market, as in float. Yeah. And, and that's really what it comes down to. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a, a regulation light way of, of, of raising public capital on, on, a, on a stock market listing. You know, everything, when you do a main market listing and you, and you go, IPO for the first time, the rigmarole, rigmarole is one way of putting it. I mean, I think that's a euphemism. <laughs> it's, it's a big process, right? And so this yeah. way of doing it is quicker, probably you could argue say cheaper, but more, more, moreover, the scrutiny um, around the, the investment isn't there. So, so that, that was a, a, a big boom. Um, and there were um, funds, SPAC funds or funds of funds that were, that were created to invest in SPACs that didn't actually have any assets, right? So you can see that this, there's this hungry capital looking for businesses and the, the focus is on deployment. It's not on necessarily the quality of business or the portfolio, it's actually we need to get this out the door because we're sat on this huge amount of capital, we're charging management fees for it. We need it to go somewhere, it needs a home. Yeah. And so that, and this is, this is, you know, some of, some of this, some of this is, 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 you know, there's, there's a element of exaggeration and anecdote, but, but this is really what happened in the last couple of years. So there was a lot of that. Um, a lot of it went into green, uh, green tech or green stocks as well. Uh, and that was an element of frustration for me because, you know, f from, from my point of view, I don't want the green transition to be hampered by a capital downturn because money's been thrown at things that it shouldn't have. You know, there is, there is, there is a lot to be said about sharing other success. You know, I hope this business does well because it's good for all of us. But there's also a lot to be said for, I hope this business doesn't raise money because that money could be better deployed somewhere yeah, else and yeah. could be better put to use elsewhere. So anyway, so that happened in the US. And it was, you know, cl clearly, you know, lots of people looking at traditional financial metrics like uh, price to earning ratios, PE ratios, and they are off the scale of historical norms. And it had the party has to end at some point. So companies are valued way more than their bottom, the bottom line. So revenue in, you know, minus your expenses, sales minus expenses equals a business. And um, mm -hmm. companies were valued their stock stock price was way higher on, on multiples of that bottom line than really uh, we'd seen before. Yeah, and of course, when the the bottom line didn't exist, so when there was no profitability or um, earnings before interest tax to talk about. They used a revenue multiple, which was a new thing. That that's not really been a thing in the past. Yes, software businesses have been valued off um, annual recurring revenues, but using just a revenue multiple as a comparator 
it's, it's ignoring everything that's going on beneath that. You know, if you if I go back to being an accountant, I'm thinking all that stuff that's happening underneath revenue, you're effectively casting aside and saying we value this business just on that. Well, it's not a sustainable way to do yeah. it, and the, and you're ignoring too much about the business from a financial point of view on that. So that as a valuation metric it's kind of died. I think you know I don't hear people talk about that anymore. So, um, the, so if, if I've got this right, um, and you'll know better than me, but the the um, the focus has changed from how much revenue do you make to are you cash flow positive or if not, as in do you make money, are you profitable, or if not, when? Mm. Right? If not now, then yeah. when? Right? Yeah, there's, the there, there, feels, there feels to be a push towards, you know, when do you get to free cash flow? Free, yeah, so free cash flow positive. So, you know, when we think about a business that has a heavy working capital demand, so like a manufacturing business, the free cash flow is, you know, when they're not only profitable, but they're also managing that procurement and sales cycle yeah. such that more money is coming in than going out. And that's really an indicator of we don't want to be constantly propping this up with new fundraisers because the problem with fundraising is, is that when you have to do it, it's not always the optimum time to do it. And you're, you're beholden to market conditions, you're beholden to macroeconomics, venture cycles, whatever it may be. There is, you know, there is a good time and a bad time, and that is not in your that is not in your gift. So, you know, so that that's definitely been a focus. But as I said, US has definitely been worse affected by it. It's been seen in the public markets, and also in the venture markets, you won't see it straight away because, of course, these venture capital investments were held privately. So at the moment, they're held by the venture investor at book value, which is what they're invested at. And until there's a capital call until they actually need more money to go in, there is no markdown in that. So no one sees this until someone actually says, well, we need the money. So we've got um, a load of companies out there. So we're talking specifically about the US, but in some European companies yeah, too. Sure. You've got companies out there that are still, you know, the last liquidity event, the last pricing of that, because they're, because they're not, they haven't flows on the stock market. The last pricing was super high. Mm. And then when the next need to raise some capital, that's when the adjustment happens, but we're not quite there yet, so. yeah. So the, so the trend is that um, 2020, 2021, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of money slush, sloshing around and some of that wasn't allocated in the most efficient way. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, that's having a knock-on effect with valuations and startups in general. So it's changed the, 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 the world a little mm -hmm. bit. But I think you're saying mainly in the US, but some over here. And um, I think we didn't have the kind of excesses over here, Correct. I don't think. Anyway, I, don't, I don't know what's normal. I'm only 31 years old, but it doesn't yeah. feel like we had the kind of excesses over here that they did over there. That's right. Um, and what are the trends that are happening, particularly in, in VC and in clean tech? You know, what, what, what's happening? Sure. Yeah, and I think I just think it's worth mentioning as well that a lot of this is driven by the interest rate environment as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, having zero negative interest rates forces money into high returning assets. So, you know, when you think about institutional investors, they're putting more of their portfolio into venture capital than they have in the past which is again driving this. Mm -hmm. Now we're in a changing interest rate environment that obviously has an effect on the market as well and it has an effect on how fee people view long-term returns. But how, how, where we're at now, um, yeah, one of the things that I, I, said, I said to you before is that we're in an industry which isn't discretionary, it's, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. So um, there, is, there are fundraisers and companies going, uh, going to market at the moment which are in sectors which you would say are discretionary. They are improving something or providing a market niche, but there's not necessarily the, the drive as there is in clean tech that it has to happen. It has to happen or we're all cooked. You know, that, that, type of, uh, that type of thing. So clean tech in Europe certainly has been in part insulated, I think. Um, and, you know, there is not just the market pressure for something like an energy efficiency innovation, like measurable energy. We know that um, EPCs um, in commercial buildings um, are going to be really important such that you won't actually be able to lease a space unless it meets a particular requirement. That's the like green to red rating you have when you rent a place, right? So, so any, any of these, these technology, um, these, these efficiency technology um, businesses will help that. Um, and that, those are the kind of wide, wider market conditions. So we've, we've seen what's happened the last couple of years uh, with interest, um, but we, we don't think that it's going to necessarily knock us off course to where we're going. Okay. Um, so you and your team see a lot of companies, a lot of slide decks, mm. uh, I imagine a lot of pitch, pitches, slide decks, um, you know, um, offers. Mm. What kind of companies do you, um, I don't want to say admire here, mm. um, not necessarily ones in your, in your portfolio, but um, what kind of companies are out there that you think are really cool? Um, yeah. 
and why? So I give you some time to think about it if you want some. <laughs> no, I mean it's, it's fine. I mean, we, yeah, you're right. We see a lot of a lot of things all the time. Um, I think that I'll, I'll mention two for very different reasons. So one is um, a German business called Empal, um, and they How do you spell that. Uh, it's an E N P A L. N P A L. P A L. Yeah. Okay. Empal. Uh, um, I, I, mean, I was made aware of this business. Um, <coughs> A little while ago, um, they've just did a, a, ser- a big Series C um, with um, SoftBank and some others, wow, um, okay. and I think they're a unicorn now, uh, based on the last uh, valuation round. Unicorn meaning uh, worth over a billion uh, euros okay. uh, in this case, right? Why it's interesting is what they're, what they're doing is really simple. They are an insta- installation business, so they are going round residential properties and sticking solar on and a battery on if you want it, and also. Um, an EV charger, but cool it, in Germany. In Germany, and I think they're going elsewhere as well. But the reason why I like it is because it's a really slick model. So if you think about the UK market now, if you want solar panels, you've got to go to a local installation business or a regional one at best. You've got it's long lead times. You've got to get a, 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 someone to come around for a quote, and then they won't also do the battery, and they won't also do the do EV the charger. charger. So it's all disaggregated. And I've got to go to someone else like Octopus, from, and I don't. They don't know, and do they? Inter- you know, are they going to talk to each other properly? Exactly, and it's like, you know, you, you, you don't, unless you're in the industry, you don't know whether to ask for the EV charge, does it solar match? So, you know, if the solar's yeah. on, does it charge, charge my car? Because I could get a dumb EV charger that doesn't charge my car from the solar, and then I think, well, actually, all I can do with it is dump it in the hot water tank or hopefully the tepio or whatever it is in yeah. the house at the time. But what, they're, what this business is doing is, is they're trying to turn it into a very slick turnaround. So you, you inquire, you get a quote which is fixed or as near as it can be. And then you get an installation team comes out, they put a commoditized solar panel on the roof, which they've got stock of, so they can do it at very short turnaround times, drop a wire through the house, an electrician comes out, wires up to the inverter, to the home battery if you want, and to the EV charger, and that's it. And, you've got, and, and you can do it as a leasing option or you can do it as a capital payment option, so you don't have the, the upfront cost and there's asset financing available for that. And I just think that that's the type of solution that we need to roll out disaggregated generation because I'm a massive believer in disaggregate, disaggregated generation everywhere. Everyone should have solar. You know, everyone should have that capability. Not necessarily a home battery because if we all get EVs, why would I get an eight kilowatt hour home battery if I've got a 64 kilowatt hour? And, and you know, I like to believe that companies like um, Indra, which is a bi-directional charging business, you know, they, they will be in, in a lot of homes so that you can do both and you can take that, it and by the way, give that it back. Whole, the, the battery maths there doesn't get talked about enough. So mm. this whole like four kilowatt solar on the roof or whatever mm. it is, home, the te- Tesla power pack, whatever it is in your, uh, what do you call them? Uh, the ones Ta- power wall. Power wall, right? Yeah, yeah. Think of power walls like five kilowatt hours, something like that. Yeah. So, and then you've got a hundred kilowatt hour Tesla outside. So you need 20 power walls to charge your yeah. Tesla. So um, the, I think we should just identify, I'm not, I think it's a great idea, but you need a, a very big battery to match your car at home if you want a fast charge. Correct. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, that's, co- that's correct. And, and, and this is the thing. I mean, the, the, this, there's I don't a want to be bit. like the Daily Mail answer, like, it's not going to work. Yeah. There's, but there's, also... There's yeah. a little bit that needs to happen in the vehicle to yes. home or vehicle to X, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I saw on LinkedIn someone using an electric mower off his Hyundai, which has just blew my mind. I was like, that's brilliant. You could take your lawnmower around and cut the lawn, you know, on the neighbor, anyway. So, so, so there's a bit that needs to happen there. There is a bit that needs to happen. Yeah. Part of it is around sharing the benefits, you know, who gets the benefits from what you're doing and how do you, how do you actually get that into, if you're, if you're playing in the balancing mechanism, so you're, you're getting revenues from that by offering up your battery for, for flexibility services, how do you actually get paid off that? kind of has to be through your energy provider, it has to be through the utility, and the utility has to be on board with that. And, you know, let's be honest, some of them are able to do that, some of them are not at the moment. So, you know, there's, there's things that need to happen, but um, at the same time, just looking at those raw, you know, those raw economics or those raw physical storage sizes in a home battery versus a vehicle, I would like to see an EV, a yeah, charger, right. and solar on every home. So um, this, this company, uh, NPAL, mm-hmm. are in Germany, they're worth more than a, million, a billion euros, mm-hmm. and they just go, back, they've, just, what, they've just nailed this process. Just, nail, you... just nailed it. It's just a slick operational exercise. And, you know, if, if, so if, uh, like I said, if I go through that process now and I want to do it for my own house, in the UK. it is painful. Oh, in the horrible. UK, it is painful. Forget it. 
apart from being expensive, right? Yeah. If you're gonna spend that much money, at least it should be easy to do. Correct. Um, but it's you know it's, it's very difficult to do. Correct. About, um, you said you had another one. before yeah, so, we get lost. Um, so the other one is uh, is another German business, um, which is now owned by Shell called Next Craftwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, I think you know them. Um, I've been to some. So they 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 always do good parties. Do they? <laughs> so uh, okay. I think I went to that. They had like a stand party in. E-World in Essen, I think, about yeah. four years ago. Yeah. And it was off the chain. Right. <laughs> um, but they're massive, right? We, need, we need to get to Germany then for that. We need to, so, yeah. yeah, do some they VPP parties. Yeah. So, yeah, they're a really cool business. I was yeah. at Kiwi Power at the time. And they're an aggregator, right? But they have got such scale. Yeah. And they've done, they've done so many different countries in one go. Correct. And centralized it. Correct. And they've got a great brand. They've got a great, great management. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they do good parties. Yeah, so when, so I mean, you know, I was looking at it when, when, when Shell bought it and, and it, you know, it probably, probably would have, uh, would have been out of our reach at the time. But I mean, I think that it's a really interesting business. They are a virtual power plant or VPP for short. What they're doing is they are bringing together flexible loads, flexible generation and energy trading. So it's a, it's, it's this vertical integration where you're managing both the, both the generation and the, and the load at the same time. And it's kind of, I like to think of it like a, a synthetic PPA, which I know you know what that is, but yeah. you know, so the idea that you're selling power to an off to, to, to an offtaker or a customer on the other side of the grid, you have to transport it over the grid, but it's as if the transaction works as if you were next door and it was over a private wire from a solar panel to a factory, right? Just lobbing a cable over the Correct. fence. Correct. Yeah. And and it's and it's just a very it's a very elegant solution. Now they they now I, I look today, they've got now 10 gigawatts under management. Yes. Oh, so it's it's absolutely massive scale. And by by using that in an intelligent way, so actually managing those loads and generations, you know, holistically aggregating it and then offering it up to the grid, you are a uh, an invaluable resource to the German for, grid. For reference, there. right? I'm pretty sure that in the UK, the biggest aggregator, I'm, I'm going to get shot down for this, but getting above a gigawatt is tough. Yeah. UK aggregators. Yeah, yeah. And I think the biggest one was Lime Jump at one point. They had a couple of gigawatts, something like that. And then you've got to question how you're counting that because some of it's just capacity market and some of it's other stuff. Mm. So these guys have got 10 gigawatts, not in one country, mm. but probably 10 countries in Europe. Yeah. With all these different TSOs, different rules and regulatory systems, billing, payments, all of it. Mm. Very, very cool. Yes, yeah, it's, it's cool. And, and you know, look, you, you, can, you can really see the value of that rather than all these things working, all, all these different assets generating assets and loads working independently, doing what they want, by bringing it all together and trading it as one, it's of huge value. And it's, it's, it's really a big part of the future. So when we think about you know, this, this kind of discussion with how much do you need to put into the grid, how much do you need to invest in the grid, how much do you need to invest in electrification, and then how much can you alleviate those investments with smart technology? This is one of the businesses I look at and think, this is an alleviation which actually negates some of the capital investment in the grid that you need and perhaps negates some of those other investments in electrification. Well, we've both got a crush on Next yeah. Craft. And how do you say it? Next Kraftwerk? Kraftwerk, Kraftwerk I think. Yeah. It's just it's so, great to say as well. Yeah. All right. Um, what else is going on? Trends, trends, trends. So what's going on in, in, in the battery world? What, what are you seeing and what are you thinking about? I know what's you guys, a battery? What? What is a battery? What is a battery? What is a battery? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You guys do, um, you do some pumped hydros? We are looking at that at the moment. Yeah, we are looking at pumped hydro. I, I think, you know, when we think about storage, we are trying to take a really broad view. You know, what you're doing in lithium ion storage is fantastic. And, you know, we are obviously a great admirer of, of your work. We're also a great admirer of that's that. That's very kind of you, Lloyd. That's all right. That's all right. I, had, I was paid to say <laughs> that. Um, but, you know, don't forget that, you know, when we look at what the research you're putting out, um, when we look at the dispatch durations, we're talking one to two hour assets at the moment, right? At the moment. At yeah. the moment, right? But we're going to have a showdown in a second. I know where you're going with this. I know. Yeah. You are, you're <laughs> I, all I'm looking at now, I'm looking at that intraday generation, and I'm looking every day at the gas peak, and I'm saying, how do we displace that <laughs> yeah, peak? It's, it's how do we displace yeah. that hump in the day? And it's, not are, two, it's not one or two hours, right? Right, and, and and you know if we think about if we think about you know a, a day a day in the life of the UK's grid, take the UK for example, you know 24, 25 gigawatts at night and forty in the in the peak of the day or something like that, and and sometimes it rises higher as we saw in the yeah. heat wave uh, the other week. 
mad that that's an example now, by the way, because the example should be the third Wednesday after Christmas or whatever it yeah. is, National Good yeah, yeah. is. And now we've got these crazy events. But well, especially, yeah. especially, especially when we're a country without really air conditioning, of course, as yeah, well, and yeah. uh, especially in domestic properties. But I think a lot of that was due to infrastructure strain yeah. uh, more than necessarily the, the demand cycle, but anyway. Anyway. So you look at that hump, that's what we're trying to get away. How do, we, how do we get rid of that? I'm not necessarily worried about the two weeks in the year where we have to draw on a, you know, a, a gas storage system to, to power the grid um, on yeah. the, in the Dunkelflaut, as the Germans call it, you know, the dark doldrums, the <laughs> not, not, not sunny, the not windy bit. Yeah. But I am worried about the 50 weeks of the year, the fact that every day we're drawing on this, these uh, combined cycles, these CCGTs, combined cycle gas, gas turbines, and they are filling in the grid, right? That's what I'm worried about. And... And I know that batteries have a massive role to play, or lithium-ion batteries. But we also think about things like pumped hydro as a really interesting, flexible resource in that space. We are also looking at you know, thermal storage, as, as you know. But thermal storage can also just be um, not in the, re in the residential setting. It can be in the grid setting as well. Now, the caveat I would add about thermal storage is that where we, where we like it is where it's electricity to heat and it stays as heat. I was going to say, to be clear about thermal storage, right, yeah. we mean... Turning electricity, getting something hot, mm -hmm. and turning that heat back to electricity later. No. Well, I, you could mean that. Or, or yeah, well, that's what the, or do you mean using the heat? I mean using the heat. Because, because one, okay. of course, because if we think about, if we think about heat as a, as a load, as an as a, as a, you know, energy-consuming um, end use, it's somewhere around you know, a quarter of our use at the moment. So if you, if you do that, so if you do electricity to heat, and then convert it back to electricity, the, the cases that I've seen, um, the losses are Loss great. Massive, They're huge. So, so, you know, your round trip efficiency is very poor, and that, that undermines a business case. By the way, right? some guys are doing it into coal as well. Turn electricity into coal, and coal, I know, I'm not using engineering parlance here, but um, get things cold, store it as coal. Oh, yeah, cold storage, then, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah so there's, there's a few of them as well. Um, yeah, but we're just talking about the hot side now. Yes, yeah. exactly. But it, but it, all it is is that it's the, the the delta, right? The temperature delta yeah. between the the ambient, right? And, and where it's interesting, I think, is where it stays as heat. And there's plenty of areas where if you can if you can use thermal storage for a heat end use, so you're displacing the gas, the local gas generation, or the electric direct electricity generation from that point. That's really interesting. And there's a, there's a business called Energy Nest actually, which is out of uh, Norway. Yeah. Um, they are doing that for industrial processes. I think that's a great concept because what they're, what they're effectively doing is they're storing the heat and then they're using it as usually as um, high temperature process steam, yeah. you know, in, in like a bottling plant or in pharmaceutical applications and displacing gas. So they're displacing gas locally, but when we think about the grid as a whole, thermal storage, I don't see that as being a way to displace yeah. the intraday because you've what obviously you got even, to convert it back. What material do you store it? So you need something with, I'm going back to the engineering days, but something with a high latent heat capacity. Correct. Right? So what kind of material is, suits that? We need Tim here, who's a mechanical engineer, who can probably tell us. Yeah, I mean, you you, can, you're, you asking, you're asking the wrong person, but the ones, the ones that I've seen, <laughs> the ones that I've seen, they're either in some, they're in some solid medium. So it's either a rock or a, or a concrete hot based rock. medium, yeah, hot yeah. rocks, yeah, yeah. Or, um, or, a, or a mixture of rocks and metals. So aluminium, for example. Um, it's got a very high latent heat. What's a, what about gravity? Let's talk gravity for a mm. second. Have you guys looked at? I haven't. <laughs> I haven't managed to make the numbers work personally. You need a vet. So gravi uh, gravitricity. Gravi gravitricity is there's one. A few, yeah. There's a few of them that are doing this gravity storage thing, where like you roll something up a hill and get it down again, mm -hmm. or you you make a big hole in the ground and then mm. lift it out. Um, are you guys looking at those those kind of companies? Well, gravi gravitational. By the storage. way, this feels like a. It's a bit of a people's front of Judea conversation, right? Because all energy storage is good. And um, I, don't, uh, I don't want to start disrespecting other energy storage technologies. But I just don't no. get the round of efficiency thing on these. No, I, I, yeah, I hear you. So gravitational storage, for, for you know, just, just, to, just to be clear, does include pumped hydro, right? And for, from, oh, my of course. Yeah, so yeah. My, from my perspective, the best gravitational storage is pumped hydro. And let's not forget, if you look at global storage at the moment, that's pretty much all done with pumped yep. hydro in some form. And just, again, to be clear, pumped hydro is moving water between a lower tail pond and an upper tail pond. And so, you know, when, you're, when you've got the excess power, you're pumping it up. And when you don't have it, you're letting it come back downhill. And that, as a round-trip efficiency, is somewhere around the 75 to 80%. 
And we got we got four or five. Um, uh, is it as high as eighty percent? I thought it, it, it went as high. Someone told me the highest it goes is seventy six percent. Okay, well, well that was um, well that's that still was, in my range of seventy five. Yeah, yeah, it so. was. It was because <laughs> that, that was um, I think that was, I think the Norway is somewhere around there. Someone can tell us better, than, but it's an old old site, right? Right, and there's the Norway. There's there's Kroaken in Scotland as well, which is is another one, uh, which is um, actually um, in a planning phase to get. Um, increased capacity so i think it's about 400 megawatt flexibility asset now so pretty big it's going to be a gigawatt if they get consented awesome. so it's a huge asset and when pumped hydro sized is sized around generally a six to ten hour duration cycle so again thinking about relinquishing that bit of intraday gas generation that seems to me like it could solve the problem alongside some you know interconnector flexibility right yeah but when we think about Agreed. the other we don't, we don't disagree yet. Right. Yeah. So when we think about the other gravitational storage businesses, Gravitricity is one. Um, I understand based on I didn't Scotland. want to single them out, actually. Grab that, um, sorry, Gravitricity. Gravitricity. Gravi Gravitricity. I didn't want to single you out. There's many other ones. There are many others, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so they, they're doing it, um, as I understand, in abandoned mine shafts. Um, so they're yep. moving a weight up and down the abandoned mine shafts. <laughs> um, I think that the, the most high-profile one is Energy Vault. Um, one, yeah, yeah. which has attracted huge amounts of, of money um, from um, different um, high-profile investors. Um, and they, their, their concept is to construct a tower, um, which has got a series of uh, pulleys and weights. Uh, and they move these uh, weights, which are concrete blocks, effectively, up yeah. and down. Uh, and the, the latent energy, the inertia stored in that gravitational, um, the gravitational potential energy of that rock being up high, as it comes back down to earth is, is released. Now, the whole premise of it, as I understand, is that they, uh, they are you know, unbreakable, uh, there is minimal maintenance, and you know, it's a very easy solution. It's mechanically easy. What goes up must come down, so the oldest saying in the book, right? Yeah, but will it go up again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so I think, I think there's general concerns. I think there's concerns from the actual amount of energy you can store. I mean, when we, when we think big, about- Big, slabs, right? Right. And when we think about pumped hydro, you know, we, we, all we're looking at is, in very simple terms, we're looking at the, the volumetric amount of water, um, we're looking at the gravitational constant, 9.8, and then we're looking at the head, so the, the distance. Yeah. But the big difference between something like pumped hydro and something like moving blocks around is that you're never gonna be able to store as much weight as you could in water and reservoir and blocks. So that's going to be an order of magnitude difference. Unless you're lifting a city up and down, right? Correct. And, and then the, the other thing is, well, how far can you actually move it up and down? So the pumped hydro sites, most of them are above 200 meters head. So 200 meters height difference between the top pond and the bottom. Wow, I didn't realize it was that high. Yeah. So it's, it's big, right? Whereas something like Energy Vault, you can't re realistically expect a 200 meter structure. So the structures um, are going to be 50, 60 meters tall. So your your head effectively is um, is is drastically less. So you discount your storage by like three or four times because it's fifty, sixty versus two hundred. Correct, correct. And obviously, then if you if you did have a two hundred meter tower, you know structurally, what does that look like? Um, where you build it? And so this this like this this basic maths we're talking through here. Mm -hmm. um, these gravity companies must also be able to do this basic maths. So they must know something that we don't. Correct. And you know, I and I don't I, I don't no, I don't know. I mean that's that's just my humble opinion. Um, you know, I, I would always I would always rather the storage medium as water being moved up and down than, than blocks on pulleys. But you know, that that is just my opinion. And and, and the the fact is is that we have not built any pumped hydro in this country for forty years. So yeah, because the planning regime. This is the thing, right? It's so planning. So there's, the, slow. there's getting the right topography, and you know, obviously, if you're flooding something and building massive dam walls, so it's all well and good saying we could do this, but it's actually what's what's achievable. Yeah. And maybe you know, in the case of um, the ones that we've uh, you know aforementioned, maybe they are achievably built, whereas pumped hydro is is that bit more difficult to get away. And of course, the the construction cycle of something like pumped hydro is very long, yeah. right? So you're looking at seven to 10 years, um, which, which obviously then has a huge effect on how it's viewed from a, a capital perspective because it's money in upfront and it's a long time until you get anything back. 
Um, but it's still, you know, as a te as a technology, I still think oh, it's the tried, trusted, and capex, scalable method. You're spending capex over that seven years of building something, mm. so you've lost money. You've got you're already down by year eight, quite a long way. It's not like building a battery where it takes you six months to build mm -hmm. and you're making money. Correct. That's the idea. Of Correct. Course. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about a couple more things. We've got a bit more time, if that's all right. Um, interconnectors. Uh, I know you have a very big passion for interconnectors. I love an interconnector. What's going on with interconnectors, Lloyd? Well, I mean, I was looking, so I was looking at the wholesale markets yesterday, and uh, the wholesale market in the UK, the day ahead price was about £282 a megawatt hour. Yep. France, €440 Euros a megawatt hour. So even if you adjust for exchange rate, that's pretty good because what that means is that you know, until now, the interconnector with France has been reliably supplying the UK with 8 to 10% of its power needs almost 24 hours a day. Because the French nukes are supplying us because we needed the power. We and the power. So it's almost ha happening consistently one way from France to the UK. Correct. And it was, it was like 23 hours a day. And then because of the difference between GMT and CET, the, France, the French peak happens slightly earlier than the UK. So the interconnectors are switched for 30, 45 minutes in the morning and the evening to send power back to France. And then for the rest of the day, we were just a net importer, right? Yep. But now a lot of the maintenance is overrun. So it's, you know, they were expected to be back online, they're not. And what that's meaning is that we're actually using that interconnector to sell power into France. And that's actually subsidizing the huge power prices that we're paying at the moment. Um, and you're also seeing the other European countries doing this as well, right? So, Hold for on, example, that mean, subsidizing the power prices. With well, I, so I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking about the energy system as a whole, right? So if if the if the in, if we're exporting power to France, we're we're generating at the strike price of let's say 280 pounds a megawatt hour, and we're exporting to France oh, and selling into their market 440. So we're gonna bl we're blaming the French for our higher power prices. In this conversation, Correct. well, <laughs> it's, 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 it's it's kind of similar. So the Nord, the, the Nordlink cable with Norway, yeah. this is this has begun become a hot political topic in Norway because Norwegian power prices historically have been very low. Yeah, they've started to go up significantly because Norway has been exporting at max capacity to the UK because we're the bid. Because we're the bid, <laughs> and they've got low water reserves in the hydro because most of their grid, yeah. almost all their grid is hydro, right? So so the Norwegian consumers complaining that our power prices are going up. Why are we shipping this power over to the, to the UK? But in reality, they are benefiting. I know that they don't feel the economics in their monthly bill, but they are benefiting because the government is collecting all that bank and then passing yeah. it back down through the municipality. So, you know, they are doing it. But if you look at the European markets, again, with France, uh, you know, I saw that Switzerland was um, importing from Germany and then selling over its inter interconnector to France, again, to profit from this arbitrage because... So, so, so interconnectors are great. I, I love interconnectors. Interconnectors need to be built thick and fast. The, 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 sort of the main premise for them is, um, firstly, is, is the geopolitical unity. So you obviously need that there. You need to not threaten to turn off someone in, in someone's interconnector. You need to remain friends for the duration of time. Um, but but, in, but reason, the reason why it really works is because you get different peaks and troughs in wind generation as depressions move across Europe. So you need the ability to move that peak power around, and that's what the interconnectors enable. But, of course, they don't work just on their own because you know, everyone has power needs, and you can't always rely on your neighbors to supply your needs um, <laughs> when you really need it. Yeah. But we, but we saw um, that we saw in the heat wave that nearly 10,000 pounds a megawatt hour was paid um, for the, from, by, the, by the UK grid uh, from Belgium yeah. to import power in an emergency situation because otherwise we're gonna have a blackout in the south. So, you know, that, that's also the cost of it. Is that it's funny, though, right? because paid. the newspaper, the, all the media around that was, we're paying the Belgians all this money. Mm. But it didn't take into account that if we didn't, we, would have a, we wouldn't have enough generation. Right? That, would, yeah. that would be bad. Yeah. That would cost way, way more. Yeah. Um, the problem isn't the Belgians. No. The problem is we have, un, we have completely underestimate, um, invested in our electricity system for Correct. too, too long. Correct. Um, all right, I've got... One more other thing I want to talk to you about, um, e-fuels. Mm. Actually, I've got two more things to talk about. If we've got time, we've got mm. people producer, we're okay, getting nods. E-fuels, mm. talk to me. <laughs> so so e-fuels, are they're going to be part of the transition. It's just yeah. how big and where they play a role. So an e-fuel or a synthetic fuel um, effectively is starting with um, what we're going to call biogenic carbon dioxide, so you know something that's captured from a carbon dioxide waste stream, something that's been burnt, 
and then adding bio, it. Sorry, so let's stop. Biogenic, 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 genic, biogenic. So um, means... as in, it was a fossil. Yeah. It's being burnt. It's then being captured. Yeah. And then you're using that oh, yeah. in yeah. this. Yeah. Right. So that is, and that is added to hydrogen. So you, you're 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 reversing thermodynamics. So you're making a molecule uh, from bringing these two things together. Yep. Um, now, where where would you where would you see it? I mean, the the real obvious one is in the aviation industry. Sustainable aviation fuel is is one of the one of the, the things. Holy Grail, so we can all still go on lovely holidays to. Correct. We go. It's yeah. like having your cake and eating it. Now, the problem is the cost. You know, it it is prohibitively expensive because um, there is you know the the price of kerosene does not account for its negative externality, right? Which yeah, is yeah. burning and producing CO two and also doing it um, at thirty eight thousand feet. And that also having a, a, a you know radiative forcing effect. So, so the you know that's that's the obvious one. But there are there are others out there. Um, the round trip efficiency is is very poor. But you know the, the the proponents of it are saying, well, if we're capturing the CO two and we're making hydrogen, this is not only a way to decarbonize these hard to abate areas like aviation. It's also a medium in which it can be stored long for a long time. Right. I mean, you think think about when we store energy chemically and batteries you know if you leave it charged up you're not going to just leave it charged up for a week you're going to be dispatching it but could you have an e-fuel sat in e-tank uh, sorry e-tank sat in tanks <laughs> for, well e -tanks. we can call Let's them e-tanks they're, yeah. they're, they're clever tanks <laughs> but could, could you have that stored in tanks for weeks months and of, of course you could i mean that's that's what we've been used to doing so that, that part of it that part of it feels good the cost of it's high so we, we hope that there's going to be a subsidy regimen for this um, and that's that looks like the direction that is you know is, is being pursued by governments, um, and we hope that there's volume enough for the off takers to actually rely on that. So you know sustainable aviation fuel companies are signing off take agreements with airlines. But the other one, of course, is, uh, is shipping, right? So shipping is, yeah, is really tough, yeah. really tough. The, the, but the good thing about shipping is you don't have to get it all that way in the air. You can kind of just put it on a big ship. True. So there's a there's a physics benefit to being in the water than the air. Of course, because you're not. Yeah, exactly. You're not actually creating the upwards thrust and then having to keep it yeah. keep it and all um, the airborne. carbon cost of doing that, which is crazy. But the, the, the shipping's filthy, is, isn't it? Shipping shipping's filthy, right? So they so so the big improvement in shipping was moving off bunker, uh, which is um, heavy sulfur fuel, yeah. so fuel oil, um, and ships that bought bunker um, uh, still continue to do so but they have to have scrubbers on board which yeah. takes the self content out or they've gone on to marine diesel effectively like low sulfur diesel now so that was that was a big change that was that was you know we, we were all thinking we were electrifying well the ships have just moved off heavy sulfur onto 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 sort of a cleaner diesel um, the difficulty is 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 ship ships move a long way without mm. refueling so most ships will have 20 or 30 days of fuel in them which you know, from a from an electrification point of view, is is pretty much impossible. Yes. So absolutely. it has to be another method. And you know, when we think about a ship as well, when it's built and financed, you want it to run for twenty five or thirty years. So you've got to think about the ships that are being built now, at scale, which are still being built to to burn diesel. Until Can you have a compatible fuel with that? Yeah. Because they are going to be run. They're not going to be scrapped. And realistically, the the the, the drive trains of them aren't going to be retrofit. Um, it's very difficult to do. So, you know, it's not like you can put a massive hydrogen tank in and say, we'll take half the capacity of this container vessel to s store hydrogen. It's not going to happen. But you it's could... A tank. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you, could see, you yeah. could see a future where you've got um, the existing combustion engine, but you're burning something else. And there are alternatives now. Or abating. Or... Well, there, there is, there is onboard carbon captures. We've seen, we've seen a couple yeah. of projects for that, um, which, is, which is one way of doing it. Um, particularly if you burn impure oxygen so that you can capture a more concentrated CO2 waste stream as opposed to just burning yep. clean, uh, normal air. But, you know, f there, are, there are options out there now. So there's drop-in green diesel fuel, um, which is uh, biofuel produced. Um, there's obviously the e-fuels. And then there's things like methanol and ammonia, which are being talked about as well, um, all with their different positives and negatives you know methanol for example well it's still a carbon-based fuel so it's still going to produce co2 ammonia is a horribly poisonous explosive chemical if a ship ran aground and dumped ammonia everywhere that would be way worse than the worst oil spill you've ever seen you know oh, so yeah. there's lots of different things um going going around there that, that people are talking about but for me 
it's always about being pragmatic and realistic. If you're building a ship now, you have to think about a fuel which is going to be compatible with the ships that are being built now. Otherwise, if you design another solution for a ship built in 20 years' time, we've already failed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, still lots of work. I would love to have a separate conversation about shipping mm. as well. And I know you, I know, um, you and the team are looking at it in, 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 uh, in detail. Um, the words green diesel always make me feel a little bit scared. Mm. Um, but of course, there's a pragmatism to it. Mm. So um, is there anything else that we should cover? I usually say, is there anything you want to plug? But we've covered a lot of bases here. Mm. Anything that Fred Olsen or one of the portfolio companies is working on that we haven't covered, that you feel like, got to get out there. Now's your chance. Um, there's nothing that I can, I can particularly think of. I, I, I would do a shameless plug. You know, that's, that's, that's always nice, and thanks for the offer. But um, <laughs> I think we've... I think we covered it all, really. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for coming on. Yeah. And um, if, we've talked about a lot of stuff which we'll put in, the, put in the show notes. So if you're interested in any of these companies or finding out more, uh, please do check the, the show notes at the bottom uh, on Spotify or however you're listening. And then remember to subscribe. Um, I've been, we've been told that we need to say this more. So please, please, please do hit the subscribe button um, because it makes our numbers go up and that's really important. All right, thanks very much. Cheers, guys. <laughs>